Welcome back, everyone. This is Robert Landau, Live Life Well TV host, with another episode of a show that we call Health and Wellness Tips. I would also like to welcome back our special guest, Ms. Leslie Marchand. She is a licensed clinical social worker. Welcome back, Leslie. Thank you. Glad to be with you again. And we're really glad that you came back for yet another sit with us. Uh, the topic today, I think, is uh, one of utmost importance. Uh, and it is called grief. It shows up in the most unexpected places. So uh, to get the ball rolling, I think it's good if we define, have a working definition of what grief actually is. So how would you define grief, Leslie? I'm glad we're starting there because we all know grief and our own experience of it. And it, it is good to have some sort of a definition. So I actually am gonna read one definition and it is, the definition of grief is not something that is, there's not a one universal definition, but this is one. A series of intense physical and psychological responses that occur following a loss. I love that, and that, that really sums it up beautifully. Yes, so talk to us about grief and the grieving process. And, and I guess the, the title of this episode implies that there may be more than one form of grief. So, so talk to us about all of that. Right, well, the first thing that comes to mind when most people hear the word grief they think it applies to the loss of a loved one, and it obviously does. It's the most common form of grief if someone dies that is close to us, we go through a grieving process. And even someone who is facing illness is going through their own grieving process of dealing with what they're facing with their illness and, you know, we all end up in the same place someday. So for all of us, it is our eventual death. But when we're facing it more closely, we are facing different emotions and learning to cope and process those emotions. And as the definition that I read said, it's not only a mental process, it's physical and psychological. Are there some very effective ways to deal with this type of grief that you're alluding to, the loss of a loved one? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different models and uh, techniques to help us cope. When we're talking about the loss of a loved one, there is a myth that eventually we get closure or we get over the loss of a loved one, which actually is a myth. We don't get over it. We learn to live with it. And at the same time, with that form of grief, there is a loss that is specific and definable. And so everything that comes after that loss is our processing and integration of it. So most people are very familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her stages of grief, which at the time that she developed it, they were called stages. And at the time she developed it, there were five stages that aren't in a linear fashion. Um, someone who, David Kessler, who has taken her work and built on it, calls it more of a scaffolding. It's just kind of a structure. But those um, aspects of grief are denial, anger, sadness or depression, bargaining, and acceptance. So we can cycle through them. We can go back and forth. Uh, David Kessler, who's continued to work with her model, has also added a sixth aspect of finding meaning. And it's not 
finding meaning in the loss of making sense of it, but it's finding meaning in our own life to move forward in a next phase of life. So in that model, ideally, you do go through different emotions and and there was the idea and to some still is that there is an eventual landing place even if you cycle back around where you find that place of acceptance and just making meaning out of your life moving forward i think one of the biggest things with this type of loss and as we discuss that model of grief is to acknowledge all of those feelings and that they can show up. And again, that's just the first way that they can show up in unexpected places. Because we think about someone we care about passing away, as much as we might know these models, it surprises us when we or someone we know lashes out in anger. And it takes an acknowledgement of, oh, that's right. It's just one of the ways that things might come out sideways a little bit. And it doesn't have to stay that way. And the sadness and depression, um, the bargaining, you know, is there something I could do, could have done differently. There are a lot of other models that are being developed and used um, that really get to the fact that it's not stages. It is not um, a step-by-step -step process by any means. It's acknowledging that we have these experiences and we learn to live with loss and make sense of our life without that person, if we're still talking about the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that many of us have been through. Uh, just personally speaking, I find that Grieving never ends. It does tend to get better with time, but I think a lot of it has to do with how we choose to manage that process and if we are good to ourselves in the process, you know. What, what's, before, before we leave this aspect of grieving, what would you say is the most important thing that one can do when one is grieving? the loss of a loved one. And, and, and even though that loss might have happened years ago, um, it's still very prevalent today. Right, right. So this is gonna come up again later when we transition into other aspects of grief, but um, it, it applies here and I think is really important. The concept of both and, and one way to make that tangible is hold on and let go. So when we've lost someone close to us, we want to hold on to them. A big part of the newer models of grief talk a lot about keeping the connection to our loved one, whether it's memories, um, how they live through us, you know, sometimes it might be a token reminder of some object that keeps us connected to them, reminds us of them. Yes, they are not in physical form anymore, but their presence is still here. So again, there are myths around grief and that there's closure. There's, there's a myth or a misconception that you have to completely let go and you don't. You can hold on. And at the same time, both and, we let go enough to find space in our life for other things and other relationships. And we can have both and to acknowledge that. So there's tangible things within that. How do you hold on? What's most meaningful for you? Is it telling stories so that you keep the memory alive? Is it focusing on, I have this certain trait that I know I got from my parents or siblings and I wanna carry it on in honor of them? You know, those types of things. And how do I build a next phase of my life and allow them to be incorporated into that and at the same time expand into new 
possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you were also alluding to other forms of grief. Talk to us about that. So there's two other forms that I want to talk about. Um, they're, they're related and that will make sense as we go on. But one of them does have to do with people and one of them has to do with other aspects of life. They both have to do with ambiguity and uncertainty. So the, the second kind is what is called ambiguous loss. That term was coined by Pauline Boss, a professor and researcher and it shows up in a lot of different ways, but it, it, the definition of ambiguous loss is a loss that occurs without closure or understanding. And as it relates to people, it shows up in, in one of two ways. And I have an analogy I've attached that helps me picture it and cement it into my brain in a way that makes sense to me. So we're talking about ambiguous loss. There's two types. One of them is leaving without goodbye, where someone in our life is physically absent, but psychologically present. So this shows up in a lot of different ways. The um, image that I have when it comes to this is the ghost in the room. You can feel someone's presence, but you can't see them. Physically absent, psychologically present. So this shows up if a family member is deployed in the military. They're still part of your family. They're still in your heart. They're still in all of your memories. Their room is down the hall, but they're somewhere else. You may not be able to communicate with them on a frequent basis. You may not know how they're doing but they're still present in your life even though they're not living in the same house with you. This shows up when people are separated because of health issues, that someone's in the hospital for an extended time or someone needs to go live in a senior living community to get the type of care that they need and they're not living in the same space as their family and friends, but they're still connected psychologically, but physically separated. The other part of ambiguous loss is the opposite. It's goodbye without leaving. Psycholo someone is psychologically absent, but physically present. So I call this the skeleton in the room. So there's someone there but they're mentally gone. So this could be as simple as your teenage kids lost in video game land, your spouse working from home and being so tied up in work that they're not present to you at that moment. And maybe they've got a big project going on. It also shows up in forms of cognitive impairment like dementia where someone may be with you, but not really present. Shows up in, you know, if someone's really sick and not able to communicate. And we're seeing a lot of that in our world now. And I have found in my work with families who have people, a loved one with dementia, and um, in my work in hospice care that understanding this definition of a type of loss and giving it a name is really powerful because people experiencing all these different forms of ambiguous loss go for years grieving and don't realize they're grieving because there's not a specific day that somebody passed away and everybody shows up and offers their condolences for what you're experiencing. Lots of these forms of, of loss and grief are happening and nobody notices. 
we don't have that natural built-in support system that shows up necessarily. I mean, yes, a lot of us have that support system. We ask for what we need and want, but even just giving it a name that this is a form of loss and a grief process. So whether it's your kids off in college and you're experiencing empty nest syndrome or a family member deployed or a loved one with dementia, there's all these different forms of loss that are happening and we're dealing with those emotions that go along with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm also hearing you say is that whether you are grieving the loss of a loved one or the loss of a friend, the loss of a job, the loss of really freedom because you can't do what you used to do pre-COVID, it's the same feeling. Right. All of those different scenarios. So how can we begin to heal ourselves and manage loss? Right. So, and you, you got to the point that you're hearing the implication. That's the third type of loss and grief is it's not about a person. There is loss that we experience in all forms in life, but it's not the loss of a person because of death or because of, you know, deployment or something like that. It's our own loss of independence, of the ability to move about in the world the way we used to. So if we're talking about 2020, which we're all living through, we're all experiencing in different yet similar ways, it's the loss of the world as we knew it. And as much as you hear, you know, things getting back to normal or new normal, it's still something different. We've lost the world as we knew it. So it has to do with loss and all of these things. Also, one of the biggest things that's important is, is it's about uncertainty. What in the world do I do with myself? What do I do with this situation? What's going to happen tomorrow? Do I have a job or not? Do I get to see my loved ones or not? Are there restrictions if we're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic? If people are separated because of, you know, living situations and, and keeping to themselves for safety, there's this constant uncertainty. And our brain likes to make sense of things. The brain doesn't like uncertainty. So again, naming it, which is why I spend a lot of time talking about the different forms of loss so that we really get it, that it is loss and we name it. So that's number one when we talk about how to cope with it. The second thing, all, all of these types of um, loss that are ambiguous and kind of the third type might be some of the researchers are calling it just non-death loss. Um, it's all about coping and resiliency. So if we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, if we have a job or not, what are our coping skills? How do we develop the ability to bounce back from challenge? And that is as personal as each individual and there are common things that, that we can do as well. So we can get into that as well. But it, like I said, naming it is, is really important. It is, it is. So uh, let's get into some of the ways that we can start to help ourselves as you've just mentioned. Right. So one of the models of um, coping with grief and developing resiliency is called the dual process model. And one of the things that's different about it than like Kubler-Ross's stages that we talked about before that's kind of identifying um, different emotions and stages, feelings that we may go through 
is it's kind of an orientation and it's an, an acknowledgement that we're going to be in different places at different times. So again, the process is not linear. So dual process means there's two things going on at any given time and we're going to bounce back and forth between the two. One of them is loss orientation. So we're just acknowledging, naming things like we talked about. We're realizing our assumptions of the way the world is going to be have been shattered. All of that stuff makes sense. We kind of know from what we've talked about and just our own personal experience. The other part of that is, again, the coping and resiliency. It's distraction. Okay, I'm not going into an office today to work. I'm not able to leave my apartment and go down the hall and eat lunch with my neighbors. So how do I do things differently? Well, I get on the phone and I call someone. I get on Zoom. I, you know, if you live somewhere where you've got a balcony or a patio, I've loved seeing people out. There's a Starbucks that I drive by every day on my way to work. And there's a group of people, I'm sure it's the same people every time, but they've got their lawn chairs out separated in the parking lot of the Starbucks, finding a new way to do things. So it's distraction from the, the feelings and emotions and the hard stuff and finding something new. It's finding new perspectives. Again, it's, it's um, shifting how we think because it's easy in these times to think, I want it to be the way it was before. Why can't this or that? It's not gonna happen. So let's find a new way of being. Let's find a new way of thinking. And how do we rebuild our life and consider new possibilities. And again, that's gonna look different for every person. And, and that aspect of what you're talking about, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, would apply to the feeling of loss of a loved one. It's that, okay, so I acknowledge that. So what can I do now to manage that better? And you were talking about a bit of a distraction. I think they're healthy distractions. I think yes. the brain needs new feedback, new experiences to help deal with where we were in terms of the grieving process. So it sounds like what you just described in how to deal with the loss of freedom from COVID can also work uh, when we are experiencing grieving the loss of a loved one or a friendship. Right. Yes. Yes. So, um, uh, something came into my mind and I lost it there for a minute, but, um, we talked before trying to remember if it was in this discussion or another discussion, but both and so there's mixed emotions. And one of the suggestions with this ambiguous loss loss that is uncertain is balancing control with acceptance. And just sorting through, what do I have control over? Because I like our, our mind likes to make sense of things. So what do I have control over and do those things? Because I like to do things. I like to, I can go to work today. Um, I can get up and make my bed and have my breakfast. I can do these things. I have control over that. And then acceptance of the things that I don't have control over. I think that's huge, acceptance, right? And, and being honest with yourself. And right. so not expecting to be further down the road in this process than where you are at the moment. You know, I think it's about being good to yourself as, as you manage these feelings and emotions and energy. Right, yeah, yeah. So we've talked about a few things. I, I, I want to come back to Pauline Boss's work. She's the one that coined the term ambiguous loss. And she has seven guidelines that she calls them. We've already talked about a few of them. Um, one of them is this both and, hold on and let go. Um, along the same lines, a second one is managing your mixed emotions of gosh, this is really hard, things have changed. 
And there's an aspect of this that's kind of nice, that life has slowed down a little bit. It is okay to have both of those feelings and, and the full spectrum of emotions and reactions to what's going on in the world or in your corner of the world, in your life and your loved ones. The balancing control with acceptance is another one. Another one is broadening your identity. We identify as different roles that we play. And when that's one of the things that we lose is a certain role or ability to act in that role, if we're not able to see family members face to face, and you know, maybe we were taking care of our grandkids or um, you know, going and watching sporting events that aren't even happening right now. How do you broaden that sense of identity? You know, maybe if you've got time on your hands, it's writing down family memories and sharing those in a different format. That's actually one thing my mom has been doing in the midst of this pandemic is she's gotten out all the photo albums and her husband can tell you that their dining room table has been covered for weeks. I'm too busy to put together photo albums for my kids. So she's putting them together for the grandkids and the, the chances we do have to get together it's sharing those memories and broadening how we do life. So um, it takes some creativity, but broadening what we think of as what our role is in the world. And, and, and again, it's different for everyone. Um, one of the other things is imagining new hopes and dreams is one of her premises, which goes along with what we talked about, but we get into a groove with what we think life is gonna look like. And sometimes challenge, which the world is experiencing now, gives us a chance to reimagine what our life and what the world will, can look like. And it's really important that we have people that are thinking of positive, things that can happen because there's a lot that we can focus on that keeps us in a rabbit hole that's not so great. So what can life look like? That's where our creative abilities are, can really be put to good use of how, how can this change? You know, maybe I don't get to see people as often or have as many close relationships, but maybe they're much deeper because we can talk about what's really important. And then the final thing is something that you and I have talked about before, but it's, it's taking the time to take care of yourself. And, and what does that look like for you? If your circumstances have changed where you can't do the normal things that you have been doing, how do you shift and adjust? What does that look like today? Mm. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, and the theme that, that we talk about often, uh, you and I, and also in this series is that it's really up to the individual uh, to invite all of these um, healing tools that you've been talking about into uh, our lives so that we can begin to feel so much better. Because I think that's what it's all about, no matter what aspect of grieving uh, that an individual might be dealing with at any particular moment, uh, all of the things you've mentioned apply to all the different settings of grieving and loss, but they will sit outside of you forever unless you choose to invite them in. And actually, you know, you, you were uh, talking about distractions and healthy distractions for, for the, the endless um, circular motion of mind chatter that in terms of negative thinking can keep us stuck in uh, the grieving process. But one of the things that, that um, we've created to manage that better is Live Life Well TV. You right. know, it's, it, it, if, if listeners don't have a way to log on to this channel themselves, then at an RCM community, for example, the activity director can show all these wonderful programs that 
won't cure people of grieving and loss, but will help people to feel a lot better about the process they're going through. And it's not only Live Life Well TV, it's so many other things, but it's up to us to invite the healing in to our lives so that we can start to feel better. So in closing, Leslie, um, how would you close this episode of very important information that if people use can really affect positive change in their lives? So if you wanted to wrap a, a pretty bow on, on what we were talking about this episode, how would you, how would you close? I would go back to the title of, of our talk and our conversation, that grief shows up in the most unexpected places. So if we recognize that, stop and pay attention to what is happening. What kind of loss are we experiencing right now? Is it someone we love has passed away? Is it we're not able to be with the people physically or psychologically that we, in a way that we want to right now? And the third form, is it really trying to wrap our head around all the change and how that shows up as loss in our world right now? And then how do we cope with that? We feel our emotions, acknowledge and accept them, be gentle with ourselves. And then through the ways that work for you and let that definition expand. And I like to, to coin it as mindful and mindless. They're both powerful. Mindfulness, meditation, you know, really connecting in with a loved one when you're having a conversation. And those distractions are things that are simply for pleasure or fun. Mindless things, it's a, cope, it's a positive coping strategy. But what are those coping strategies? Do them, tell people, you know, have somebody join you in using those same, same coping strategies and find what helps you face a new day. What helps you bounce back and have that resilience? We talk about resilience and you think of a, you know, rubber band that bounces back into shape and it may be a different shape, but how do we keep that flexibility in the midst of our changing world? And it's as much in our mind as it is in our thoughts and feelings and actions. And be gentle with yourself. Mm. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Uh, not only in this uh, final closing part of this episode, but all through uh, this episode. Thank you so much, Leslie, for uh, helping to define and map out uh, steps to feel better about loss, to feel better about grieving, and, and uh, pinpointing the fact that it really is about each one of us uh, to, to care enough about ourselves to feel better about grieving and loss. So thank you so much, Leslie, for joining us this episode. Very important stuff. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. And we look forward to seeing you on more episodes of Health and Wellness Tips. With that said, thank you, Leslie Marchand, clinical uh, licensed social worker. And this has been Robert Landau, Live Life Well TV host. Be well, and we will see you on another episode.